Okay, um, I have a few notes prepared, which I don't usually do, so. Um, I guess in Tipperary, uh, we haven't usually had this many people interested in any energy debate, um, and to have so many people here today is, is, is very heartening for me, because I, I often find myself talking to empty rooms. Um, and I would like to, I suppose, thank everyone for coming here today, and I'd like to thank the department for supporting us as well in terms of coming today and, and supporting the debate at a local level um, about the challenge facing us in terms of energy. Um, and I'd also, at this stage, I'd like to say, um, I'd like to, I suppose, reflect on the, the debate that the department have undertaken over the last number of months. They've had more sessions and more consultations with the public than many policy discussions we've had in Ireland. Um, and I really hope that um, the reality of a sustainable energy future that probably the department want is reflected in the white paper and gets through with our senior politicians and with the Department of Public Expenditure and the Department of Finance, which ultimately impact quite heavily on policy. And without our support as citizens, it's unlikely that our senior politicians will support maybe the goals that the Department of Energy have um, in terms of making our energy use more sustainable. So I think it's up to us to demand that of our politicians. And that's what today is about. It's not just to, to maybe outline the case for change, but, <clears throat> but also outline how we may impact that. So when the politicians come and talk about getting elected, we need to make sure that sustainable energy is part of getting elected for them. Okay, so what I'm going to cover this morning, I only have a few minutes. I'm going to cover the reality of climate change. Um, we're going to talk about our own energy use in Ireland and, and energy security and so on. And really, I suppose my job in the energy agency is generally to help people um, reduce their energy use, reduce their energy costs, and reduce the environmental impact of their energy use. And normally, when, you know, when people are, I suppose, silly enough to ask me to speak, I temper what I say to what I think the audience want to hear. And unfortunately, we all do that too much in Ireland. And what, as a result of that, I don't think anyone has really grasped, and there's a very small number of people in Ireland who have grasped the challenge of climate change and the potential impacts that are facing us and our children. This is not some abstract thing that's 100 years into the future or, or 200 years into the future. We've seen roads washed away. We've seen a lot of damage. We've seen flooding in Limerick that, that never flooded and so on. And that's just going to accelerate. Um, so really, I'm going to outline that today and, and talk about um, the real challenges for us. And I would hope that this, the later morning session is going to outline the, the solutions. So I'm not going to talk about the solutions. That's what everyone else is going to talk about. So in terms of the reality of Ireland's energy use, we're one of the worst in the world from a carbon intensity. We're one of the worst in the world from um, an energy use per, per capita. Um, we have, I suppose, the, the reality is Irish people travel more on less public transport, um, live in poorer homes, and use more dirtier electricity than most other people on the planet. Um, and that is the reality, and we can all, I suppose, take our share of, of, of blame or whatever in that, but I think we, we all need to recognise that that needs to change. Um, and that's Eurostat figures that, you know, we are one of the most import independent and we have one of the lowest renewable shares. And that has increased from 3% to about 7% over the last number of years. And that's a combination of, um, of wind energy and, I suppose, less energy used through the recession. So this is a report from the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, which is made up of 830 leading scientists from 85 countries, and they have studied extensively the impacts of climate change. And they are more certain than they are that smoking causes cancer, that fossil fuel use and change in land use is causing uh, a widespread and damaging change to our climate. Um, so they essentially have five scenarios from today of what we do with fossil fuel. So the top one in red, and the grey bar is we just keep emitting fossil fuel as we currently do or get worse. Um, and that rising line is the, the overall concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and because CO2 lasts for 100 years, it's not something that you switch off and it, 
suddenly the impact is gone. It lasts and lasts and lasts into the future. Um, and essentially, if we look at what would 8.5 degrees be for Ireland, our climate would be probably like North Africa. Tunisia um, would have about the average temperature difference between today and, and there. Um, even with the concentration today, and I suppose if we think about Tunisia and think that's nice, Italy would move to more or less the, the, the climate of, of the Arabian Peninsula. So all the food that's produced in all of those countries would no longer be producible. Um, and obviously a growing population on the, on the planet, we would not be able to support the life we have on this planet. And therefore, you, know, you can make your own conclusions of what would happen there. And maybe that is a worst case scenario, but that is what we are going to now. That is with our current use. And even if we take the, 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 the best case scenario of rapid decrease in fossil fuel use, with all the fossil fuels we have admitted into the climate already, a lot of the southern parts of Europe would be catapulted to a climate of, of Ethiopia. Um, and we, we all, I suppose, know what that means. Um, that is the reality of climate change, um, as the leading scientists across the world say, not me. Um, this is a little bit in terms of where all this heat is going. So we might think that the land temperature hasn't increased that much. But obviously we know that, you know, boiling a kettle full of water takes a lot longer than boiling a kettle full of, full of air. Um, and in reality, the, the ocean is absorbing all of that heat, which is causing all the storms, which is what's washing away our roads and, and causing the intense uh, rainfall. And that is what we are seeing. I don't think I need to say many words on, on this particular uh, graph. You know, 2014 is the warmest year on, on record. The last 10 years have had nine of the 10 warmest years on record. Um, there is a big change happening in our climate, and we can see it. Even some simple things like flood-related infections. Cholera was almost gone by the 1950s, and now it's spreading. And even the HSE, or any time there's a flood event in Ireland, we get a, a huge spike in flood-related infections in Ireland, in, the, you know, in, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So there's a lot of things that happen that, through climate change that are maybe, you, you don't think of them straight away. There, there are a lot of different impacts. And if we talk about, one of the, one of the things that the IPCC has done is, is they have measured how much CO2 we've put in the atmosphere and how much we can put in the atmosphere to limit global warming or, or climate change to two degrees, which is the theory of a safe goal. Um, and many people would argue that it isn't all that safe a goal, but <coughs> that's what we internationally have come up with. Um, what that means essentially is over the next 20 years or, or, or so, by 2040, we more or less have to have stopped using fossil fuels for electricity and heating and by 2050 for transport. So that's 35 years. That's back between now and 1970. Um, 1980, sorry. 1980, can't do my sums. Um, so to get that sort of buy-in, to get that sort of change, and to, to think about what that means for, for our children or the next generation, there's very little CO2 they can emit, and there's very little um, energy that will support that, because obviously CO2 comes from food production as well. Um, and it means they will, if we don't make the choice now, they will have a horrible choice um, in 20 years. So in order to do that change and in order to change drastically from where we are today in terms of carbon generation and, and energy use, we need to make some fairly stark and politically very difficult decisions. So unless citizens support politicians to say, these things need to change, we cannot keep doing business as usual, the politicians won't be able to do the change because they won't get elected if they make a change. So we all need to play our role in, in educating people um, surrounding this. So I'm going to move off climate change a little bit. It's a particularly nice message, first thing in the morning. Um, and we think about where all the money goes from our use of fossil fuels. So a totally different tack. Across the EU, um, over half of our imports come from Russia. Um, so we can all understand we are now currently paying Russia to destabilize our, our continent. Um, 
And we look at some of the bailouts of southern, some of the southern European states. Cyprus has got a big loan from Russia. So instead of having to invade, they now just buy off governments. And now Cyprus are objecting to further sanctions on Russia for the whole Crimean Ukraine debate. There, there's talk about something similar in Syria and, or in, in Greece and so on. So we need to think about the economic impact of we, us sending 6.7 billion euros a year from Ireland to the Middle East and Russia and what that money is now being used for. So it may be used for, and I heard yesterday an ad on Irish radio, go to see the penguins in Dubai. I don't know if anyone heard that. Um, we're paying for all of that through our use of fossil fuels and through our wasteful use of fossil fuels. Um, and John Fitzgerald, when he was launching the white paper discussion from the SRI, said we need to be very careful about the wealth transfer from us in energy policy. So it may be better for us to spend more money on energy than send all of that money to destabilizing parts of the world. You know, and we look at the, the huge global subsidies, you know, carb gas can, can write <laughs> off 100% of the development costs of carb gas against their tax. So their tax is 25% on an estimated 10 billion, which is two and a half billion in tax, but they can write off all the development costs, which are somewhere in the region of two and a half billion. Um, so we need to think about all of those things and we should decide to spend more money on investing in local renewables and local jobs and retrofitting buildings and so on. We also, I suppose, coming down the tracks is, is it maybe quite a large fine from EU for not meeting our 16% renewable energy target or our 20% reduction in CO2 target. Um, and if we turn that around and instead of spending that billion on, on all those other things, we look at investing in our in our homes, our businesses, in our communities, and our public transport. And we're just finishing a, a report that's, that's titled Tipperary's 500 million energy opportunity, because that's how much the county of Tipperary spends on energy every year. And we can see that there's almost 4,000 jobs um, could be done in the next four years. So 1,000 jobs a year on that retrofit. And that's built up from a lot of the, the things we're going to talk about in the afternoon, the case studies, and so on. So our, our options. Some of them aren't very pretty. Um, we talk about this, you know, we're, we, we all talk about the safety of wind energy and so on. We had two deaths in Tipperary in the last week laying the natural gas network. You know, so, so non, non, no infrastructure is inherently perfectly safe. Um, so we need to think about all of those. So we have many choices, but obviously efficiency and renewables are the ones that are best for, for the climate and best for energy security. So just something very simple on wind, you know, there's the biggest investment in any energy use in the world has been in wind last year, and second was solar. China, USA, Spain, Germany, UK, Denmark, Google, Apple, everyone else is investing in wind. It does work. Um, it is cheap, it is profitable, um, and it does work in an Irish context. However, it is inequitable, it is predominantly developer-led, and it is increasingly being sold to the capital markets. There are other things, I suppose, but I would like to say that we should replace anti-wind, but only if I own, and we decide where they, where they go. And just conclusions, really. Um, it is clear for most people now who read into the subject that we do need to transition away from fossil fuels. We need to be careful about the money flows from the poorest in society to be, to be protected, but also in terms of geopolitical. Um, we need to support our politicians to make those difficult choices. Um, and the last thing I'm just going to say really is the fossil fuel lobby are very similar to big tobacco in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. There is no doubt they are insidiously funding misinformation around climate change. And we need to think about that as citizens. And you know, Electric Ireland, their biggest, biggest profit is coming from Money Point, which is the biggest carbon emitter in the country, and they're not uh, unguilty of impacting policy in Ireland. So I suppose the last thing to say is the solutions are available. We're going to hear about them this, this, later this morning. And uh, I'm looking forward to the, the discussion. Thank you very much.